We've been doing this Old Testament lessons. I'm glad to see you've got a full screen. I've got a part of a screen at the back, but it's okay. I'll manage. Um, Old Testament lessons. What did we talk about last week? Judges. Judges? Yes. Chapter? Two. Two. And what were we talking about? Making the same mistakes again and again. And that's what the book of Judges is all about. Is going, I tell you what, it's good to have Steve in the church. At least he listens, you know. The rest of you I'm not so sure about. Um, but thank you, Steve. You make me feel good, you know. At least I know all the preparation during the week is uh, not forgotten. I'm just teasing you guys. But this morning we're going to do the second session and we're actually looking at Othniel, God's answer. You know, when we think about life, there are many people we have no idea who they are. And I was looking at a little list of people in 2009 in Time Magazine's Heroes and Icons. You know, as you do online when you have nothing else to do. And I found three names. Brad Pitt. Tiger Woods, four names, Tiger Woods, Michelle Obama, and Rick Warren. The four of them were listed in the top 100 heroes and icons of the year 2009. But as I read through the list, there were many names I didn't recognize. And one of them was a lady called Haditha Mani. How many of you heard of her? I just want to see how many liars we have in the place. <laughs> Haditha Omani was sold into slavery for $500. <laughs> All those things driving me mad today. <laughs> oh, I haven't got a flat, flat battery. Oh, that's got a flat battery. No, it says it's full. She was sold into slavery for $500 in 1996. Her home country, Niger, outlawed slavery in 2003, but the practice still continues and shows itself through the trafficking of mostly women and children. Not just in Niger, but in many other parts of the world, as we well know from the discussion the other Monday night. It isn't easy to know you are worth more than others are telling you. To know you have the right to stand up against injustice. To know the world is still beautiful and safe despite its horrors. Not too many of us have the constitution to stand against power as Marnie did. And when she took her country to a West African court for failing to enforce its own laws and denying her right to freedom. I knew that this was the only way to protect my child from suffering the same fate as myself. Nobody deserves to be enslaved, she said. And she proved it when she won her case in 2008. And as a result, was listed in 2009 as one of the top 100 top heroes around the world. It takes courage to take a stand like that. When you come from the background that she has been born into. But let's take a quick survey of Bible characters. And uh, how many of you know a guy called Samson? <laughs> A couple of you know Samson, well done. And how many of you know Othniel? Othniel. Othniel was fir the first judge and Samuel, uh, Samson was the last one. O Othniel, yeah, it's working. Othniel was the best and Samson was the worst. And yet, isn't it strange we remember Samson better than we do on the meal? It may be that his story is a little longer, or it may be that we relate better to him. Because Samson was flawed, just like you and I are. Whereas when we read off Neil's story, there is no negative comment made about him anywhere in Scripture. And so let's read off Neil's story this morning as we start in Judges 3, and we're going to read verses 7 to 11. And it goes like this, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. 
The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan, Rashus Thane, uh, king of Aram Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, uh, king of Azram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. You see, Othniel was a hero. And according to the dictionary, a hero is someone who commits an act of a remarkable bravery or has shown an admirable quality such as great courage or strength of character. Most of the heroes we know don't make the top hundred in Time magazine. But who are some of the heroes you look to and are grateful for? Sometimes heroes can be the most unexpected people in life. In fact, I read a, a story just recently about Leonardo Diaz, a Colombian mountaineer climber, uh, who discovered um, that he would gladly pay for extra minutes. Listen to his story. July, on, the, on July the 26th, uh, on, in July, 26-year-old Leonardo Diaz got one of those solicitation calls that most of us hang up on. But for him, it saved his life. Maria Angelica Triana, a service representative with Bell South Corp, was calling to see if she could sell him some more minutes on his prepaid cellular account. Diaz had something more urgent to discuss. He had become disoriented while climbing one of Colombia's highest peaks and desperately needed help. You see, he had started off to climb the Nevada del Rey Rios, a 17,600-foot mountain carrying only chocolates, a bottle of brandy, and his prepaid cell phone, which had run out of minutes. At about 13,000 feet, the lack of oxygen clouded his judgment. He was beginning to suffer from hypothermia, and a second nightfall was fast approaching. Bell South summoned help, but search efforts had to be postponed because of darkness. So through the night, Triana... Uh, called Diaz every 20 minutes to keep him alert. Late that night, a group of French climbers who were already on the mountain found Diaz and stayed with him until a rescue team arrived the following morning. Who would have guessed that a telemarketer from a cell phone company could save your life? So next time they phone, don't hang up. <laughs> on few citizens, would, uh, few Israelites would have expected a biblical hero to come from among the Kenazites. You see, when we look at Othniel's story, he belonged to an ethnic minority who were descendants of Kenaz. In verse 9, his name was Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. And the Kenaz actually were Kenazites. And they were in Canaan before the Israelites ever came. They were an ungodly people who belonged to the Edom tribe. And were opposed to the people of God. And so, somehow we're not sure how some of these Kenazites got absorbed into Israel. And one of them, uh, and some of them joined the tribe of Judah. Jephunneh, you've all heard of him, right? Yeah, he was Caleb's father. And he was a Kenazite. He was a man who had come from a, a tribe that was opposed to God and had served idols. And yet his son Caleb became one of the two spies who trusted God in spite of what their eyes saw. Something transformed Caleb. How Othniel and his clan became part of the nation of Israel isn't known but he, they became Jews by conversion rather than by descent. By the time Othniel was born, his people had been converted for generations now, and they were, yet they were still identified by their non-Jewish heritage. In other words, the minority classification still stuck. He was Othniel the Kenazite. 
And isn't it interesting how little titles like that can stick all the way through life? Those derogatory little titles that get applied to people. And Othniel was no exception. I'm not sure whether this story is an example of God's amazing grace or God's huge sense of humor. The first and greatest judge, God's superhero, was from a minority group related to some of Israel's greatest enemies, the Edomites. We were just saying, God is miraculous. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> you know, God's no respecter of person. God can choose whom he wants. Even if they're an outcast, even if they're from a, a, an enemy tribe, God will choose the right person for the job. But you know what I love about him is his background didn't limit his future. We don't have much information on Othniel in the Bible. His biography is noticeably short. But we do know that he wasn't limited by his background and proved himself before God called him to deliver Israel. He showed heroic qualities long before he became God's superhero. You see in Judges chapter 1 and verses 12 to 13, Caleb, his uncle, said, I will give my daughter Asash in marriage to the one who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz, was the one who conquered it. So Aksa became Othniel's wife. I, I love the story because... I think Othniel must have known Asker prior to that. She was, after all, a cousin and thought that she was worth risking his life for. You see, this isn't a random story, and it isn't just perhaps for chance. So he goes into the battle, wins the battle, and he wins himself a wife. I wonder if this was the forerunner to The Bachelor TV show. <laughs> You know, maybe they read the story and think that they could make money out of this. But whether you think this is a good way to find a husband for your daughter or, or a cheap wife doesn't really matter. It does make the point that he was a man of purpose and courage and do what was needed to get the job done. Most leaders prove themselves in small ways before they ever achieve success. In fact, one of the management gurus, Peter Drucker, says that employers should hire on the basis of past performance more than future potential. Because what a person has achieved, they will achieve again. And they may go on and achieve their full potential, but if you're hiring simply on potential, you can be disappointed. I wonder if Peter Drucker had read Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus said something pretty similar. That it's necessary to prove yourself in the small things before being trusted with greater things. In fact, in Luke chapter 16 verses 11 and 12 it says, If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And he goes on and says, And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? You see, there's a simple principle here that we've got to learn to be faithful in the small things before God releases greater things to us. And we see this in, in life in the work, in, in, at work in the life of Othniel. Here he is being faithful in one challenge and God looks at him and says, you know what, you're the type of guy I like because you're prepared to go for it and give it your best shot and I believe in you. Being every, behind every successful man is a successful or smart woman. You know, I love that. I've got a smart woman at home. And she was smart. She stayed at home today. <coughs> Talk about a twisting, but she did. But Othniel got a great wife who was an extraordinarily strong woman. I love her. You know why? Because women in the, New, in the Old Testament were not privileged in any way. They did not get property. So when their father died, the property went to the sons. The women received nothing. And if a woman received property and she died, it reverted to her eldest son. But it never went to women unless there was no one else it could go to. And so Axa, 
she's married to Othniel, and she, she looks at him and says, Hey, honey, why don't you go and ask Dad for a big piece of ground? <laughs> I love it. She, she's a feisty woman. <laughs> so Othniel goes along and asks for some ground, and, and you know what? He gets it. Gets given this huge piece of ground. There's only one problem with it. I'm far behind myself. There's only one problem with it. It's in the desert. It's in the Negev. There's nothing there. How many of us would sort of look at that and say, Thank you, Father. I'm really glad you gave me a heap of desert. Just some sands and rocks. And if you've been to the Negev, there's nothing there. But you know what? She's a little cleverer than that. So that she urged, she goes to her father. And if you read the story in Judges 1, uh, 14, it says when... Axa married Othniel. She urged him to ask her father for a field. So they get it. As she got down off her donkey, Caleb asked her, what's the matter? She said, let me have another gift. Hey, what are our kids like that sometimes? You know, one's not good enough. Can I have another gift? You've already given me land in the Negev. Now please give me springs of water too. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Now that changes the whole story. Because we know that the Jewish people, because uh, with their water, have made the desert bloom like a rose. Water is the key. She was an awesome person. And so Caleb gives her the upper and lower springs. I like to think that a woman as smart as, as this was a key motivator to the success of Othniel in the days that lie ahead. But it's also a great reminder that the success of a marriage may not be how it started, but how it is lived out together that counts. Right? Some marriages can start abysmally and end incredibly well. So we've got to learn to press on. But I want us to understand something. The most important reason for Othniel's victory was neither his background nor his marriage. It was being filled with God's Spirit. In Judges chapter 3 and verse 9 it says, But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against Cushan Rishathaim of Aram, and the Lord gave Othniel victory over him. You see, it's that whole cycle that we spoke about last year, week, about them turning to God, and then the, the ruler of the day who inspired them to turn to God dies, and they go back to sin. They cry out to God in, for forgiveness. God forgives them, raises up another judge who leads them to victory again. As soon as the judge dies, what happened? They go back to sin. And so this is the cycle that they caught in. Israel has sinned and God has become angry and so he's disciplined the entire country. And for eight miserable years, they occupied and ruled by a king um, who made their lives a misery. And, and it worked because... Misery brought them to their senses and they cried out to God for help. The name of, king, of the king of Mesopotamia who invaded Israel actually means wicked, desperately wicked. That's what his name means. So you get the idea this guy wasn't very nice. And he's not somebody we would elect not even in New Zealand. Well, our elections are pretty strange sometimes. But moving right along. You see, he'd come down from the north, and we think that he'd invaded Israel all the way down to Judah, which is where Othniel came from. So he'd taken over the whole of the, the, the promised land and subdued it for eight years, taking the best of the country for himself. The best of the produce, the best of the livestock, the best of everything for himself. Charles Spurgeon said that God never allows his people to sin successfully. <laughs> oh, it's a powerful statement, isn't it? 
He says their sin will either destroy them or will invite the chastening hand of God. If the history of the Israelites teach us anything, it's obvious that uh, the obvious lesson is that Proverbs 14:34, godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And I won't say any more about New Zealand. When life gets difficult, there are often options open to us. Have you noticed that? If you're in a bad job, you can look for a better one. If you're in a marriage, miserable marriage, no, you don't look for a better partner. You go for counseling and you find help to work through the, the issues. If you're failing school tests, you can get extra lessons and you can make a difference. If you're in chronic pain, you may be able to get a prescription to help with that. You see, we have choices, but you know what? There are some times in life where we have no choice. We have no choice but to trust God. And that's when God comes through for us. The second thing is, the nation sinned was the first God picked off Neil. He had three million men to choose from, but he chose this one because he was the right man for the job. Othniel is identified as, as a Mosifa or deliverer rather than a Sopet or a, a ruler. Othniel is said to have governed Safat Israel. He wasn't a king. He was a deliverer that God raised up. And the secret to his success is God sent his spirit to do through Othniel what Othniel couldn't do by himself. You remember the scripture we love to quote, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that was the truth in Othniel's life. He wasn't the deliverer. God was the deliverer through Othniel by the power of his spirit as he raised him up and gave him wisdom and military might. You see, this was the secret of, of Neil's strength, as it was with Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. And it is a must for us in our New Testament believers' lives as well. The power of God's Holy Spirit to give us the ability to be the people God wants us to be. To be deliverers in our day. T.J. Bach, not the musician, said this. The Holy Spirit longs to reveal to you the deeper things of God. He longs to love through you. He longs to work through you. Through the blessed Holy Spirit, you may have strength for every duty, wisdom for every problem, comfort in every sorrow, joy in His overflowing service. You see, that's the key to the Christian life, is the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're finding that you're getting a little muttery about serving God, that's a word I made up, it's all right, don't worry, you won't find it in the dictionary. It means to mutter continuously. So if you're a bit muttery, you know, a bit like buttery, but muttery, oh, we won't go. All right, if you're a little muttery, it's time to go back and ask for a fresh filling of God's spirit. You know why? Because that sets you free to be able to do what needs to be done rather than to focus on what can't be done. Mm -hmm. And too often we're looking at what can't be done, at the impossible things. And you know what I want to say to you today? If it's impossible for you, it's not impossible for God. You might find it really, really difficult, but God will find it easy. Uh, like what they said to Reinhard Bonker some years ago, he was in, a, in an area of Europe, and they said to him, uh, you've come to a very, very difficult part of Europe to share the gospel. These are hard nuts to crack. And Reinhardt smiled and said, my God's got a big nut crack. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's not up to us. It's the power of God's spirit in our lives. God's superhero, Neil faced a formidable enemy. King Cushion Rishathaim of Aram, remember his name means wicked, doubly wicked. We'll keep, call him King Cush for short because uh, his name ties me up. 
But he'd come down from the north, and Israel lived between two superpowers. In the northeast, they had um, a King Cush of Mesopotamia, and down in the northwest, they had Egypt, and they were sandwiched between the middle of these two superpowers. And so this king comes down. It wasn't just that the kingdom of Aram was powerful, but it was wicked and desperately wicked. To make matters worse, Othniel didn't have a lot to work with. Resources were stretched. A foreign power had been draining the nation for eight years. The people were spiritually weak and sinful. They were worshipping pagan gods. Uh, they were desperate but not repentant. They cried out to God for help but never asked for forgiveness or renounced their paganism. Othniel didn't have much to work with. That's what made Othniel a hero. Taking on a formidable enemy under the worst possible circumstances. Knowing that if it wasn't for God, he would never win. And that's what made him a hero. Just recently I came across two very interesting stories. And I'm, I love history. So, you know, you get these little history tidbits now and then just sort of put into the message. More because I enjoy them than you do. But if you don't, just doze off for a minute. You already have. Story one. Do you know a guy by the name of Easy Eddie? Easy Eddie? Nobody? No. Easy Eddie was a Chicago lawyer with one major client, El Capone. <laughs> and his whole mandate was to keep Al Capone, a violent mobster who was in control over Chicago's crime syndicates, including illegal whiskey uh, during the Prohibition era, era, prostitution, extortion, murder, and more. It was any easy in his job to keep Al Capone out of jail, and he was incredibly good at it. As a result, he was well rewarded, and in fact, his house was... His personal mansion took up an entire city block. Easy Eddie was a tough character, but he had one soft spot, and that was his son. He provided his son with money and clothes and education, and yet he provided him with a very bad example. And so he decided to do something about it. He went to the authorities and he told them the truth about Al Capone in order to set his son a good example to follow in later life and to give him a good name to live up to. Within a year of testifying against the mob, Easy Eddie was gunned down and killed on a lonely Chicago street. Easy Eddie took on a formidable enemy. He became a hero to his son, but it cost him his life. But he left an example to follow. Story two. During World War II, Butch O'Hare was a fighter pilot assigned to an aircraft carrier group in the Pacific. And one day while flying a mission, he saw that his fuel hadn't been topped up and was incredibly low and his tanks were almost empty. And that he would not be able to complete the mission that he'd been tasked to do with the um, uh, squadron that he was flying with. So he had to pull out of the formation and fly back to the carrier. On the way back, he encountered a squadron of Japanese Zeros uh, making their way across the ocean to attack the uh, carrier force. Realizing that the carrier force was vulnerable because it had launched all its fighter aircraft and bombers, Butch O'Hare took on the formidable Japanese squadron. And there was a ferocious fight that significantly damaged his plane but caused the Japanese attackers to give up. He saved the carrier and made it back to land alive. You see, Butch O'Hare took on a formidable enemy and became a hero. He went on to become one of the first aces of World War II. And Chicago's International Airport is named after him. O'Hare International. So what's the significance of these two stories? I know you're hoping there is. <laughs> well, the truth of it is, Butch O'Hare was easy any son. You see, he had seen his father stand up for what was right at immense personal cost and decided to do the same thing. 
What a challenge. That's what heroes do. From Othniel over 3,000 years ago to heroes today, heroes take on formidable enemies and they leave a legacy for the next generation. God gives the victory. It's important to note that it was God who gave Othniel the victory. Verse 10, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram and the Lord gave Othniel victory over him. So there was peace in the land for 40 years. Then Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. You see, as we look at Othniel, Othniel was a courageous man from a limited background with a smart wife filled with God's spirit who took on a formidable enemy under the worst possible circumstances and God turned defeat into victory, failure into success and war into peace. That's what our God can do. And He does it with people who are available to be used by Him to become His heroes, to become an answer to prayers. So as we sum up this morning, there are several biographies of heroes in the book of Judges. And yet Othniel is the only one for whom there is no criticism. He was... A good and righteous man. He was the judge's judge. He was the leader's leader. He was the hero's hero. He was the kind of person, if I'm honest, I would like to be. To be remembered as somebody who took a stand and did what was right. One Warren Wiersbe, a New Testament scholar, says this. Othniel not only rescued his nation from bondage, but also served his people as judge for 40 years. This meant that he exercised authority in managing the affairs of the nation. And it was his spiritual and civil leadership that brought rest to the land. Never underestimate the good that one person can do who is filled with the Spirit of God and obedient to the will of God. Right? One person makes a difference. One person can make a difference. And that's what the book of Judges teaches us time and time again. When the nation is going into sin and wickedness and calls out to God, God raises up a person who is filled with the Spirit, who is empowered by God to make a difference in the community that they live in. You know what I believe sincerely that that is what God has called you and I to be in this day. That God has called you and I to be Othniels or Othnielesses, whichever your gender is. But that we would take a stand for God, that we would allow God by His Spirit to fill us, to overflowing, that He would empower us, that He would give us a vision to make a difference and to rescue folk who have no hope outside of God. We look at our nation and if it doesn't disturb you, it certainly disturbs me. As I look at the laws that are being passed and the things that are being agreed to, we have a wicked nation. And if ever there was a time when men and women of God, with the power of the Spirit of God in their lives, stood up and were counted, today is the day. If ever there was a time for Othniels to rise up, then today is the day. If ever there was a time that God was looking for men and women in whom to put His Spirit and to do amazing exploits, it's today. And yet so often I feel the church has decided to sit back and cruise on to the end of time. That we're just hanging on. We're not making a difference. We're not making an impact. Why? Because Jesus is coming soon. And I'm grateful Jesus is coming soon. But he's looking for Othniels. Men and women who will do the impossible because of the Spirit of God at work in them and through them. Never under underestimate the good that one person can do who is filled with the Spirit of God and obedient to the will of God. Will you be an Othniel? Will you be God's answer to someone's desperate prayer? Israel was crying out to God for deliverance. Othniel 
was their answer to prayer. Will you be somebody's answer to prayer? Six lessons we learn from Othniel's story and I'm finished. The first one is that we've got to choose not to be limited by the events of your past. I don't know what your past looks like. But sometimes there's stuff there that haunts us. And stuff that longs to drag us down and drag us back. We've got to learn not to be limited by the events of the past. If we've confessed them and asked God to forgive us, He has forgiven us. And we are free. Lesson two. Allow others to encourage and counsel. Othniel listened to his wife. You know, guys, maybe you should listen to your wife. Wives, maybe you should listen to your husband. Or maybe God's given you a friend who just has some incredible wisdom that God wants to speak to you through. It's so important for us to be teachable. We don't know it all. We need people to counsel us. Lesson three, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Every day. See, the scripture says that we are to be continually filled with the Spirit. And the answer, the reason for that is because we leak. And so we need more of God's Spirit coming in than is going out. Fourthly, we need to be willing to take on a formidable enemy under the worst possible circumstances because God is on our side. You can't wait until all the stars line up because they never will. You can't wait until the circumstances are right because they never will be. You know what we've got to do is we've got to be willing to take on a formidable enemy when everything looks impossible. Because God is on our side. Firstly, recognize that it's God who gives the victory. It's not up to me. It is, and that I have to stand and be part of the process, but it's God who guarantees victory. And you know, with the, those people you've been speaking to about Jesus who are tough nuts and just don't want to hear. It's not up to you to convince them. It's up to God's Spirit to break down the walls and the barriers and to crack their, crack their nuts. Recognize that it's God who gives the victory. And then finally, allow God to turn defeat into victory and failure into success. How many times have we failed? More than I care to remember. But you know what I'm really convinced about is God can turn failure into success. That he can turn defeat into victory if I will give him the opportunity. The story is told and I'm finished. Of a little girl who was running on her way to a party. She was so excited to be going to this party. She'd been dressed in this little party dress and had little frills and she had a stocking on her. She just looked so cute. She was dressed up. She had a little gift in her hand and she's skipping down the road. She's so excited to be going to this party. And on the way she slipped and fell into a mud puddle. Eventually after a couple of hours when she hadn't shown up at the party but the mother phoned her mother and said, your daughter hasn't shown up. Where is she? So the mother went to look and found her daughter sitting in the mud puddle. You see, she lost hope of going to the party because now she was dead. The tragedy of the story is if she'd got up and gone home, her mother could have changed her and got her to the party anyway. You know what, sometimes when we hit a puddle in life, we're so like that little girl. We just sit there. 
Instead of going back to the Father and saying, Father, I've really messed up. Could you clean me up and get me to the party? It's a lesson we need to learn. That God is always the God who is for us. Who wants what's best for us. And will do what we ask. My prayer today is that God would raise up a new generation of Othniki. 